Let's identify the feedback type in each of these circuits. Let's furthermore identify the sign of A and beta without actually doing any calculations. In circuit A, I can walk all the way to the amplifier without crossing the feedback path. Therefore, this is series. On the output side, if I start at the load resistor and I start walking back towards the amplifier, I cross the feedback path. This is shunt. In circuit B, I cross the feedback path at the input side, so this is shunt, and I cross it at the output side too. This amplifier has the shunt-shunt feedback configuration. In example C, I don't cross the feedback path at all on either side of the amplifier. This is series-series feedback. In circuit D, I cross the feedback path on both the input and output side of the amplifier. This is therefore shunt-shunt feedback. Circuit E is a little bit tricky, but this connection is the same as if the connection had been up here. They're all connected by a wire. This is also shunt at the input side. And at the output side, I can walk all the way to the transistor without crossing the feedback path. Therefore, this is series at the output. Now that I've identified the type of feedback in each of these circuits, if I wanted to know the effect of the feedback on the input and output impedance, I could merely look back at the chart for which we've already calculated one of the lines as an example and note whether the input and output impedance is increased or decreased. For example, for the series-series configuration, I can see immediately that the input impedance will be increased relative to the case without the feedback network and the output impedance would be increased as well. Keep in mind that A beta is a negative number. For the shunt shunt configuration, I can see that both the input and output impedance will be modified depending upon the sign of A beta. In each of these circuits, let's identify the sign of A and beta. A is relatively easy to identify. Let's identify A by imagining that the feedback is missing. For example, in the first circuit, imagine that there's no resistor. In that situation, we have a non-inverting amplifier, so the gain would be positive. The same thing is true in the second amplifier. The amplifier is not inverting, so the quantity A would be positive. The same thing is true in circuit C. Without the feedback path in circuit D, we have a standard common emitting configuration. The common emitting configuration is an inverting amplifier. Therefore, A would be negative. The same thing is true for circuit E. If the feedback path is broken, then the gain A would be negative. Rather than consider beta alone, let's think about the loop. Is the loop gain in each of these circuits positive or negative? A signal going around this feedback path sees an inversion. Therefore, the quantity A beta is negative. I can thus infer that beta would be a negative number. A signal going around the loop in amplifier B does not see any inversion, therefore the loop gain, A beta, would be a positive number, and I can infer that beta would also be positive. This is actually an example of positive feedback, so we have to be very careful using the chart. Circuit C contains an inversion, so the loop gain would be negative. The quantity beta would be negative. Circuit D sees an inversion because of the common emitting configuration in the loop. Therefore, the loop gain, A beta, would be negative, and I can infer that beta has to be positive. In configuration E, a signal running around in this loop doesn't see a common emitting configuration. Rather, it sees a common collector configuration. This is a non-inverting amplifier from the perspective of a signal in that loop. Therefore, the quantity A beta beta is a positive number and I can infer that beta would be negative. It's quite common that we can look at a circuit and immediately see by inspection both the type of feedback that we have and the signs of both A and beta. Let's look at a couple of examples now. In the first example, I would like to identify the feedback type and determine the gain and input and output impedances both without and with feedback. We're going to assume ideal op amps. First of all, I can tell from inspection that we have the shunt-shunt configuration. The input impedance of an ideal op amp is infinite. Therefore, the input impedance here is infinity. The output impedance of an ideal op amp is zero. Therefore, the output impedance here is zero. The gain of this amplifier is negative infinity because it's in the inverting configuration and there's no feedback path to stabilize the gain. 
You might recognize the configuration with feedback as a standard inverting configuration for an op amp. The gain of the circuit is just given by the ratio of the two resistors. So the gain is negative two. Do you see what negative feedback has done to the circuit? We've taken an amplifier that had a gain magnitude of infinity and we've brought it all the way down to two. And what did we achieve by sacrificing so much gain? Well, we've achieved stability the gain is more stable in this configuration than it would have been without the feedback. We've also altered the input and output impedances. The input impedance with the feedback is going to be only one kilo ohm. The reason I know that is because with the feedback network, with zero volts at the non-inverting part of the amplifier, we expect to have zero volts at the inverting port as well. The output impedance is still zero. The input impedance is clearly reduced. Had the output impedance been a positive number, we would have reduced that also. Let's now look at another example. In this example, if I were an ant crawling on this wire, I would be able to walk all the way to the edge of that amplifier without crossing the feedback network on both the input and output sides. Therefore, I can identify this feedback as series series. I expect both the input and output impedance to increase with series series feedback according to the chart. The input impedance without the feedback is just infinity. The input impedance with the feedback is also infinite because I've assumed ideal op amps. But had the input impedance originally been some positive number, it would have gotten bigger. The original output impedance of the amplifier is zero. The output impedance with the series series feedback has increased to two kilo ohms. It comes from the two kilo ohm resistor that's now attached to the load that wasn't there before. The gain without feedback is infinite, since this is a non-inverting configuration. With the feedback network attached, I can see that all of the current passing through the 5 kilo ohm resistor will also pass through the 2 kilo ohm resistor because current cannot enter the node of an ideal amplifier. Because no current passes through the 1 kilo ohm resistor at the input side, I can identify this voltage as the input voltage. Because of the stabilizing effect of the negative feedback, I can furthermore identify the voltage here as the input voltage. Let's apply Ohm's law to the two currents. The current through the 5 kilo ohm resistor is given by the output voltage divided by 5 kilo ohms, and that's equal to the current through the 2 kilo ohm resistor which is just given by the input voltage divided by 2 kilo ohms. Therefore, the gain in this circuit is 5 halves. The negative feedback in this particular amplifier has caused the gain to fall from infinity down to 5 halves. It has also caused the output impedance to increase, and had the input impedance been a number other than infinity, it would have increased as well. In the next video, we'll look at amplifiers that are not ideal and see what negative feedback does to those.